Hello and welcome to Parrot Analytics' fifth annual Global Demand Awards, where we highlight the most in-demand TV series, movies, and talent of 2022. I am today joined by Rebecca Glashow, BBC Studios Global Distribution CEO. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Really appreciate it. Oh, Brandon, happy new year. I'm so glad to start the new year off with you folks. Thank you. Happy new year to you as well. And let's just jump right in. You have previously said publicly that BBC Studios is well positioned to be a major supplier in this market. And one look at all the projects the company has a hand in highlights that fact as you currently help contribute to Deep breath on my part, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Apple, Amazon, HBO, CBS, Paramount+, Plus, AMC and BBC America, Fox, and more. So just to start off, why is now the best time to be a content partner and seller? Well, you know, I'll start by saying, you know, BBC Studios really has been sort of the sleeping giant supplying the industry for a long time. I think what has really transformed it is, of course, been the advent of global streamers and trying to reach audiences around the world and has really opened up sort of British content to much larger audiences. Now, I think we've always found great uh, alignment with a lot of partners here over the years, certainly HBO, AMC, BBC America, where we've had longstanding relationships. But as these partners really seek to go after lots of specific audiences who want storytelling across whether it be natural history landmarks or going after edgy dramas or our great kids clothing like Bluey, you know, we've really been able to grow the business exponentially as I think the appetite for global storytelling or British storytelling, I should say, has opened up in the marketplace. And we've really seen that business grow, you know, transformatively, frankly, over the last few years. But to be able to accomplish that in terms of the number of genres you guys span and the number of partners you work with, you have to work with, with a lot of different people. So I'm curious, can you speak to the importance of partnerships and collaborations within the TV industry and how BBC approaches these relationships with other studios and platforms at a time when seemingly everything is more competitive than it's ever been? Yeah, well, I, absolutely. I think it is rare to have a studio that covers so many different genres like we do. I think we most actively work in the space of, of course, scripted dramas and have for quite a long time natural history, which is really an area that we've committed to both through science and natural history landmarks, as well as kids. All of that content is both expensive content, so really requires a level of partnership and commitment and looking forward. And in building audiences outside the UK, you know, it, it really is about investing in those audiences and that programming and finding the right home, right? And I'd say not all that content is going to work in all the different services and really finding a home. So I'll, I'll exemplify Warner Discovery has been the home for natural history for us, you know, really for, for over a decade and really getting behind that programming and supporting it is so critical because that takes five years to make. And so you really are in business a long time where you're talking about what you want to get out of it, talking about what that project is about and really having the patience uh, to wait for it. So I think in large part, that is a bit of it. Kids with Bluey, where we work with Disney, same thing. Kids, you know, it takes nurturing. You know, it's it's rare to get a hit out of the gate. We are very proud of what we've done with Bluey, but it's an incredible show to come out of Australia, but it needed the right home, right? The right home that delivered the audiences, that knew how to build it bigger each season. And I think with a lot of these big franchises and it's not unique to us, it's getting the right support. You know, you can have a great show and it never finds its audiences. And for us, making that partnership to get behind the content and IP helps establish the right home. Yeah, Hollywood is unfortunately littered with great shows that unfortunately didn't find their audience. But in terms of natural history, as, as someone who snuck off from their eighth grade natural history museum trip, so I could see even more of the exhibits, I greatly appreciate the effort you guys are putting into that genre, an underserved genre that's educational and entertaining. But sticking with this trend of all the different partnerships that you guys do uh, work on, is there any worry that the expected consolidation in the market over the next few years changes that lucrative seller's dynamic we have at the moment? Well, it's absolutely benefited us as a studio, but we're not just a studio. We are a mixed economy. We're in the channel business. 
in this market with BBC America, but across the globe with kids channels um, and lifestyle channels, et cetera. And then we're in the streaming business. We have a service called BritBox. It's very targeted. We have a service called Select in this market. We have a small little uh, business called BBC News that touches everyone around the world and is really, um, to me, sort of the shining star of what comes out of the BBC as far as representative of you know, the brand, the quality, and the trust that we have with consumers. So we are in a mixed economy. That has certainly been a fast growing part of our business right now. But when you look at the fact that we can put some of this stuff into our channels and grow our own audiences, as well as look to put things into our streaming services, we are able to sort of balance the portfolio and minimize the risk. And that makes a lot of sense given today's market. I mean, you, you've part, like you mentioned, you've partnered with ITV for the drama centric streamer BritBox. There's BBC, BBC Select, which focuses on your non scripted fare. And sticking with this theme, I'm curious, what is the mental math that goes on at BBC Studios when trying to balance being a great external supplier with building up your own stockpile of digital real estate for the future? Yeah, well, I think it starts with where can we really win? Right. I mean, and, and obviously that's a question a lot of people are asking themselves. We are not mass market outside the UK. In the UK, we are the market. But when you get to international markets, you have to look at the portfolio of where we can really succeed. Betting on BritBox, which is really a great path for what I would say British drama and has really reached this avid fan base that is sort of unstated. It brings all this great content to one place, but it really is, you know, for the most part, very genre specific and serving a super fan that might have gotten that content elsewhere, but we've really delivered an engaged service with that. Same with Select, which is very doc based. We are well aware that being a commercial mass market entertainment play takes money, investment, um, and built in audiences. And as a British supplier, you know, you look around the marketplace and you think, am I going to win in that mass market approach? So we've taken very selective approaches to where we do think we can, I wouldn't even say win, win, but but succeed, be profitable, run businesses that are really serving an audience, but ultimately giving us a return on investment. So that's how, you know, it's been very tactical. I think I'm very happy with where we sit because of sort of the influx you say. And I I think in the UK, you know, we are ultimately a major streamer with iPlayer, right? And it's just how do you replicate the power of that brand in each market? In each market, we've taken very unique approaches depending on what our position is. And you mentioned the super fan and how you are offering up a very specific slice. Now, I know it's akin to asking to, to pick your favorite child, but is there a Brit Box title that is, you know, your favorite above all that you would love to highlight? Well, I'd never like to pick, pick favorite children. I mean, I think what's so unique to the BBC is that because our purpose is to serve so many different audiences, I find fans across the board in so many different ways and how they've engaged with us because the BBC in many ways, whether they be, it's been broadcast on the BBC and we've invested in it, whether we've sold it into the marketplace has touched so much more content that you really know. I mean, for me, I, I've made this joke. I mean, my kids are too old. I, I certainly wish I could go back and have Bluey as I've raised my kids because, you know, the TV and I won't knock any other TV that's out in the marketplace for, for is, is quite astonishingly poor. I couldn't be more excited about the future of Doctor Who. And I'm sure you've seen some announcements about an incredible talent that's sitting both in front of behind the camera and reimagining that for... Um, basically the next generation of audiences. We talked a little bit before the camera went on about Luther, which I'm a super fan of. So, but I think there, you know, that is exactly what is unique about us because we function, whether it be in docs, whether it be in kids, whether it be in natural history or drama, in so many different areas, people are engaging with our content and our super fans, and in some cases, not even knowing it. So because you have this wide breadth of programming, these wide swath of audiences that you're attracting, how does the BBC adapt to changing viewer habits and preferences? And how do you see the role of traditional TV channels evolving in this very fluid future that we're entering? Yeah, you know, as I touched on a little bit, you know, we are in, we have a multiple sort of partnerships and paths in this market. 
BBC America has been our flagship channel. I would say that has been representative of a lot of our bigger shows, certainly Natural History and Doctor Who. But you know, we did feel certain audiences were underserved and hence came the, the advent of BritBox. I think again, as and I run sort of the global marketplace for BBC, it will be different in each market. And, and it all goes back to, you know, is this audience being served by our existing routes into the marketplace? Do we see a path to profitability? Ultimately, at our heart, we're public service. We want to place bets that we feel comfortable in. You know, we've been here 100 years. I don't want to be the person who who, who stops us from being here for the next 100 years. I don't and in think some ways, about that. But no one wants that on their blotch on their resume, right? But but ultimately, I, that's forced us to be quite methodical. And I think the other element of that is we know who we are as a brand, right? And we do know our audiences in many ways from all the great work we've done in the UK with iPlayer and what resonates. And I think that has been an important part for us in having the, yes, our great relationships with our partners, but investing in whether it be bbc.com, whether it be Britbox, it's paramount because we have to be understand our own audiences. And you know, many, many content suppliers for years have not, right? We've really ceded that to our partners and function quite blindly. And I'd say we're not unique in that obviously being partner dependent, we did fly blind, I'd say outside the UK. And that is led in many ways to these very intentional efforts to really understand our audiences. But I'd say we're still at the beginning of that. That is that is not in our DNA at heart. We're a creative engine and creative organization. And how we make sure we're leveraging data as we build for the next hundred years is absolutely, I'll be honest to admit, the transition that we and many organizations are, are, you know, are trying to get through. I was gonna say blindly figuring our way out, but I think every day it's been quite strong. And and as I said, you know, the digital assets I've mentioned have been a big um, asset for us, certainly in North America. And to your point, we're at a thrilling yet precarious transi transition phase across the yeah. whole industry. So everyone seems yeah. seemingly trying to answer the same tough questions. And yeah. you've mentioned it across this conversation so far, but BBC has long produced global content from all over the world. Now, seemingly every major entertainment company is looking to do the same. So do you think BBC has an advantage because you're able to monetize both original series and U U.S. remakes simultane simultaneously, similar to what's happening with the amazing ghosts at the moment. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, it is, I, I certainly think British content, and I really identify ourselves as sort of the best of British, does have its own unique voice and storytelling and creative community. And, you know, that's certainly the joy of my job is bringing that into the world. There are obviously themes that are universal, Ghost being a perfect example of one of them. So the format business has been a big area of growth, but it goes back to, and I would never say, well, we were there first and so we know best. However, <laughs> I won't underplay. My daughter went to school today with her BBC sweatshirt that said 100 years of the BBC. You know, and what does that mean? Because there's not 100 years of TV. You know, we started in radio. We've been serving audiences globally for a hundred years. You know, that's where it started. And I, I say that in it, it's always been the role of the BBC to of course deliver for the British population, but we've always taken the content around the world. In particular, clearly in certain areas. I mean, I, natural, to the point of natural history, and I hate to go back to that, but being the daughter of a scientist, there is no other company that is committed to delivering, I mean, to see the team that works behind our science and natural history programming, to see people who grew up studying um, the earth or stu and, and sciences and to be in media and to be able to combine those passions takes time and investment and commitment. And, you know, yes, others do it now, but I would say, you know, we are really committed to it. We'll still be doing it, right, in 50 years. And I'd say the difference with us in our relationship with our partners is, They've seen that. They've seen the quality of the content we've delivered decade over decade. We're not chasing ratings, right? We're, we give a lot of creative freedom to our partners, our creators and our writers because we're not chasing advertising. And in a lot of ways, and we've built these long-standing relationships 
both in our market and now outside, I'd say in the UK, that is, and now in North America and other areas um, around the world where, you know, there's a deep trust in both our creative capability, our taste level, the editorial sort of expectations that what we put on ourselves are probably more stringent um, than most. And I think, and we deliver, right? And again, back to we're, we're, we are not um, going to overspend and over ego. We are going to deliver high quality programming, probably at a budget level that is much more reasonable because we've been doing it for so long. And I, and it sounds really silly, but in a business that is so unpredictable, especially now, and delivering content that is, you know, subjective, ultimately, right, whether it's going to be a hit or not, I think knowing who is creating that content and knowing the lenses in which we go into looking at everything we make and execute gives us an edge. Long answer, but I really believe it's true. What a good one. And I think it speaks to something you just mentioned. For, for anyone who doesn't know, Rebecca's father was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, correct? I'm sure nobody listening knows that, but they do now. <laughs> but I, is, I, must, yes. I must say, though, that that there it's not like BBC doesn't have a, a great pulse of what's creatively and artistically boundary pushing and compelling. But there is an ingrained logic to the strategy and moves of the entire company that, that you are, are leading. And I, I think that is reflected. That's the kind of scientific, logical approach to what is a very, you know, volatile industry at the moment. And it's not to me. And again, I say this as a, as as much a fan as it is my responsibility to take our brand and our content to the world. Is we are never chasing the moment. We are always holding ourselves. And I, I say that truly because I I'm not the person creating the content and delivering. I say that in respect of my colleagues of you know ultimately long-term value. And so it that's what gives you the patience to work forever and the access. And I, I laugh, this is a very personal story, but I'll tell it anyway, which is, so you mentioned my father, he's got a lot of friends, happened to also be very famous scientists. And one of them called me and said, I did this interview with the BBC um, and they had done over COVID, you know, reached out to these other incredible scientists and done these shorts to put up on iPlayer, you know, sort of day in the life of, you know, Nobel Prize winners or chemists, et cetera. And I thought, God, if you wouldn't see that on TV here, that wouldn't be, you know, that would not be exported by anyone else. And he's like, how do we get that to more people around the world? And I said, can't even believe we did that. You know, it's, we, we're doing it without, and I say that I don't, I'm not even, I don't want to be a snob because I'm not taking my bias around scientists, but there is a quality aspect that in the end, and that is spoken a bit about a handful of the streamers that are out there that have that reputation when you turn on the service, what you're gonna get. And I'd say BBC is really the model for that. And, and I think that's why we're here. And I think that's why we continue to grow even during this volatility. I'm glad you mentioned growth because BBC reported record financial growth last summer. The company recently broke streaming ratings records with the World Cup. Uh, CE, BBC Studio CEO Tom Fussell has publicly discussed the freedom this allows to invest in future growth at a time when most in entertainment media companies seem to be scaling back. So I'm curious, what does that growth look like for you moving forward? And does it possibly include bringing the BBC News brand to U.S. streaming? So, I mean, I would, you know, I, I, that's probably, I, you know, I say I always laugh about the BBC never tends to sort of share its business. And it was really nice for Tom to share that news because it, it, it is an incredible success story, our growth and our continued growth. But I think the, to his point, what that does give us as we all are going into an uncertain time and eyes wide open, you know, budgets are being cut. There's certainly an expectation that, you know, um, there'll be a slowdown, as you said earlier in the conversation with a lot of our key buyers, and you can anticipate that, but we're going in with the ability to place some other bets, right? Because we've had, you know, seen that level of success that we're able to make more strategic investments against our own content, for example. We've done a lot of co-production, we've shared risk, but, you know, increasing our own appetite to get bet against our own programming, giving you the, given, having given you the spiel of why I think we can win, I think we can place more risk on that. I think investing in some of our digital products 
um, and putting more behind that. I'm so proud of what we've created with Select, but you know, we've created it really in the shadows, putting very little energy and attention, gives us the time to think about how do we put more behind that. And then you you mentioned my my love, BBC News, and it's my love because it's, I think, the most incredible brand in the news marketplace. And like all things BBC, we've we've done it to deliver um, the best impartial news to the world with newsrooms all around the world at every major event with zero agenda. And I think now is a moment where we can really look to invest further, both from a user experience, from a product experience, from an infrastructure perspective, to amplify that brand and that voice. I won't comment on any other podcasts I've listened to recently, but you know, um, I really think we're the ones poised to win in global news. We are the brand, um, but we have to put money behind it. And I think that you know, without sharing too much, I do think to Tom's point, we have the ability to invest and to me, I want nothing more than to invest in ourselves. Now, earlier, you'd mentioned a couple key titles that I'm interested in. Bluey, Doctor Who. I'm curious, how does BBC nurture and grow IP t- uh, that is really connecting on a global scale? Because, I mean, Bluey, as you mentioned, huge in the kids' sphere. Doctor Who, a long-running beloved franchise. And these kind of familiar, higher uh, awareness IP seem to be ruling the day in entertainment yeah. these days. Yeah, I mean, I I do think, and you know, there's been a lot of talk in the ecosystem about sort of um, freedom given to creative talent and what that relationship looks like. And I would say, you know, and this goes back to some of the points I've made because the BBC um, doesn't have to worry about the number of episodes, the length of the episode, you know, you know, some of the very traditional expectations from a TV franchise, for example, or of having to reach four quadrants with one show or having to build up this very complicated writer's room because we have 22 episodes that have to go in. You know, we've been untethered in a lot of ways, always, even before Netflix sort of untethered the entire marketplace in a sense. And I, I would say, and again, I say this as, as a fangirl of the creative community in my peers inside BBC is, you know, they, there is a lot of freedom and a really incredible relationship with our, so, you know, the team behind Bluey, which is actually an Australian team, which despite its huge success, you know, and the Macy's Day Parade and, and, and as, I mean, it's like the biggest moment, you know, for a kid's brand to see that balloon in the Macy's Day Parade, but ultimately that's a, that's an Australia based team that is not changed, you know, the same writer and creator behind it. And, you know, we've really, allow that to sort of go unaffected despite the success. And I get, again, I say this, um, which I think is, is really the critical piece of it. It's the creator relationship. And I think that's something that BBC has always done incredibly well is build those relationships. And I'd say the same, you know, as we see Russell T Davies, who was very much involved in many decades of the success of the previous Doctor Who come back, um, he loves that brand as much as the fans love that brand, as much as BBC love that brand. And, and you can't fake that. And I think it is about bringing the right teams in place and giving them the right trust and freedom. So I would really account that for this. You know, that's where the magic is really made. We are, cont- I'm a, you know, I'm facilitating what we do into the marketplace. That's how I see my role, but that's really where the magic's happening. Now, Rebecca, I consider myself a very hardworking Parrot Analytics employee, but do I have permission to blame you when I slack off for the upcoming Doctor Who anniversary special? Because I am just over the moon excited about that. Yeah, I mean, you should be because dot, dot, dot. I I don't want to, I don't even know what I'm allowed to share, but I, I have seen, and I will just say, I am so inspired by what and I, I and that goes back to partnership i'm could the it was so overjoyed to announce the relationship with disney you know who obviously we have the tremendous relationship with bluey but who cares so deeply about especially these big family brands and knowing how to connect with audiences and i just feel like that it is the moment to really take doctor who to the world i mean i grew up in it in the 70s and to bring it back um, with that talent behind it, I think you need to take all the time you need to watch Doctor Who. 
There you go. Heard it here first. I can't call <laughs> responsible parrot analytics. I'm sorry, but I, I got to tune in. <laughs> Last question, and it'll get you out of here because we just mentioned some of the biggest titles. Can you discuss any current or upcoming projects that you are particularly excited about and why? Well, no, um, I can. I mean, I think that, um, as I said earlier, I tend not to talk about my favorite projects. I would say ultimately there is a lot coming in 2023. We are continuing to build an incredible team out in LA um, who will, well, well, that's not the best answer to that question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did this so terribly, but- No worries. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I I feel everyone has their own personal love and affection for the, and so I don't want to bias anyone, um, but all I can say is lots more to come in 2023. Well, I can tell you we are going to be loyal, devoted viewers. Can't wait for all that's to come. Rebecca, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon. Have a great day. Take care. I hope you enjoyed that video from our Global Demand Awards virtual festival. Reach out to us today and find out why some of the largest organizations around the globe are partnering with Parrot Analytics to solve some of their most pressing problems.